Well, good morning. Um, this is kind of fun, isn't it? I don't know that I have ever been so excited to, like, see these seats. Um, we're getting kind of back to normal. But as I say that, I will frequently remind you of... Um, a line from a song that you've probably never heard of unless you're from Canada. Um, it was written by a guy named Bruce Coburn who is like a treasure in Canada. Um, and he's also a Christian. But he's got this line from a song, it's a great line, it says, the trouble with normal is it keeps getting worse. Um, and uh, I think sometimes we feel that way, don't we? Brad, do you know Bruce Coburn? He's perfect. Okay. <laughs> to check with my Canadian friends. Um, if you look around and you can imagine all the hard work that went into this, um, I, I want to highlight a person and a group. Mark Aron led the charge on getting this done, and that is significant because this week his father passed away. And uh, he is up in Michigan with his mother, family, and um, it tells you a lot about Mark, that he didn't leave until he knew this would be taken care of. And our deacons stepped in and others and said, we've got you back, you're back, we will make sure this is taken care of. Um, that's how the body of Christ is supposed to work. And I just, I really appreciate that. Um, let me, pr I just want to pray for Mark. Let's pray. Father, we know yesterday was the funeral for Mark's father. Um, he just led us in communion last week. And we were powerfully moved by that. We were reminded of your grace your, your protection over us, your healing power, not just physically, but, but spiritually, emotionally, relationally. And Mark is today um, grieving in another way, struggling in another way. And he is our dear brother and friend. Lord, even as I pray this, I, I have received word that Cheryl Young's mother has passed away. And Lord, we ask for the same comfort and presence and peace that you give to Mark, that you would give to Cheryl, and, and to those that I'm not even thinking of, Lord, uh, or don't yet know about, we ask for uh, your comfort. And we thank you that you give it, and we thank you that you give it to us this morning, and in fact, that's one of the key points of this passage. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. When I was a kid, um, I was actually born in Los Angeles. I uh, grew up on the West Coast, kind of between Los Angeles, Northern California, and then uh, really Oregon is what I consider home. But my grandparents lived in Los Angeles pretty much my entire life. And there was a restaurant that every time I would go and visit my grandparents, or my family would go and visit my grandparents, there was a particular restaurant that we would go to. And I was a little kid, so I didn't appreciate the fact that this restaurant was in Malibu. Um, so it was a nice restaurant. But the best part of this restaurant, what I did appreciate, is that this restaurant was on the ocean. And when I say it was on the ocean, it was on the ocean. I mean, we would get a seat... There's this whole bank of windows, and we would get a table right next to the windows. And as you sat there, the waves would come crashing up onto the windows. And as you're a little kid, you can imagine, I just, I had to be as close as possible to the window and was just, just waiting, for, okay, for the next large wave to come that would actually make it up on the windows, and how big would it be? And then that started to stress me out because I was sure at some point a wave was coming through that window and would sweep me away. Uh, that never happened to me. As it turns out, and this actually is a horrible breakdown for everything I'm going to say in the sermon. Uh, as it turns out, that did happen once, um, but it didn't sweep anyone away. It happened when the restaurant was closed. There was a 
storm and wave big enough, it went right into that restaurant. Um, that's a little unfortunate. Um, if I could judge by the memes that I am seeing online, 2020 is just like that restaurant, right? It's like one wave after the next wave after the next wave comes crashing into the window. And we are kind of sitting here wondering when, if we might be swept away. And what's really interesting to me is this past week, I have probably, I've talked with probably about 10 people who are living in their personal lives a microcosm of what we are all witnessing in 2020. I talked this past week to people who are, who have just lost their job, and at the same time, their marriage is falling apart, one wave after the other. I talked with someone who is experiencing extreme, severe health issues. There was one diagnosis, and now there is another wave after wave. I talked with one person this week who is actually right now on her way to Dallas to comfort an uncle because her aunt just passed away. And I think this is the third death in the last few weeks in her family. I had a woman that I was talking to just sobbing and sobbing and sobbing because she keeps making one destructive decision after another. And she's looking at her life and going, why does this keep happening? Or better, why do I keep doing this? And she is just struggling with the consequences that keep hitting her like the waves that are crashing in to those windows at the Sea Lion restaurant. Every single one of us have a way that we deal, we have a strategy for dealing with, a plan for dealing with the waves that keep crashing into our lives. It may not be thought out or articulated, but we have a default plan. For some of us, for the people I talk to, it's, it's I'm going to build my own little safe reality where nothing is going to get me. And, and for some of the people I've talked to this week, that's involved alcohol. For some of the people I've talked to, it's a, I am cutting myself off from any possible sort of bad news. We have people who I've talked to where their strategy is an intimate connection with someone else that will support me. And this person is going from relationship to relationship to relationship. And is wondering why she is never finding her longings met. The one that I'm most likely to give into is I'm going to take control of my environment. I'm going to take control of my world so my world doesn't hurt me. And I'm going to do that by working hard. I'm going to do that by what I accumulate. And I just find that I can't work hard enough or accumulate enough. To ever control this world. Well, last week, if you were here or if you joined us online, you remember that Slade took us through Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. And what we saw in that passage is that God has adopted us as his children. We are his heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. But we also saw, if you remember, how that passage ended. And the passage ended with basically the assurance that just because you're an adopted son, adopted child of the creator of the universe, that does not mean that you are exempt from suffering. In fact, it ensures that you are going to encounter suffering in this fallen world. And in today's passage, we're going to look at Romans chapter 8. We're going to go through verses 18 through 30. Paul is going to take us into the why and the how of enduring the suffering that he introduced us to at the end of verse 17 of Romans 8. 
we start in verse 18 because verse 18 is really the, the theme. It's, it's the summary of this entire passage. And so I know that you are hoping beyond hope that I would just read this verse and say, let's go eat. Um, but I do want to read this verse and I want to point out a couple of things that Paul is then going to tease out in the remaining verses. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time Right? He's referring back to what he just talked about in, in verse 17. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul starts by, by an important word that, that we should latch on to, and it is the word consider. And if you have been kind of tracking this, as we've studied Romans chapter 8, you will remember that what happens in our mind, how we think, what we think about, what we focus on is critically important for us in our Christian life, in our relationship with God. And Paul immediately starts in this passage with what he thinks about. He considers the sufferings that he encounters in this present day a certain way. He thinks about them a certain way. And the way that he thinks about them is that they're not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. You see, Paul is saying there, there is a now and there is a then. And the now is characterized by suffering. And the then is characterized by this future glory that is going to be revealed. When he says not worth comparing, that's, that's actually kind of one big word. It's, it's the idea of, of a scale, a balance scale. And Paul is saying, if you take and put all the sufferings that you encounter in this world and you put it on one tray of that scale, and then you take what is in front of you, what is coming, what the then is going to be, that is just going to crash down. It will be like the sufferings don't even matter. And what is that glory? We're going to see this developed a little bit further. It is the glory of us being revealed for who we are, and seeing Christ for who he is in a way that is impossible in a fallen and broken world. And that is the truth that we must consider, that we must think about. There is a now and there is a then. And that then radically outweighs what we encounter today. In the rest of the passage, Paul is going to tell us uh, that we are to wait and that we are to wait patiently in the face of suffering. And that's what he's going to develop through the rest of this passage. And he's going to show us why it is that we should wait patiently. And he's going to show us how it is that we will wait patiently. And the why is in verses uh, 18 through 25. And we'll pick up in verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This idea of, of waiting with eager longing is, is an idea of, of intense anticipation. It's, it's one of the only times, in fact, this is probably the first time this word was used in the Greek language. It, it is a single word, and it has the idea of intense anticipation. It's, it's like a child the night before Christmas. And what all of creation is intensely eagerly anticipating is the revelation of God's sons. It is when we will be seen for who we were designed to be without all of the effects of sin, without the fears, without the desires that mislead us, without the wounds that's, that paralyze us. That is what even all of creation is waiting for. Well, why is creation longing for it? And he answers that in verses 20 and 21. In verse 20, he talks about the now. What is the reality for creation now? The reality of creation is that it's subjected to futility. This word futility has the idea of, of literally being worthless or valueless. And, and what it means in this context is creation cannot fulfill its purposes. 
And the reason that creation cannot fulfill its purposes is because its fate is tied with our fate. What is the then? The then is in verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage. When will that happen? When will it be set free from its futility? And it will obtain the glory of the freedom, and it's all tied to the revelation of us, our ultimate salvation. The when is when we become who we were meant to be. This fallen world will then become what it was meant to be. And Paul ends this section with an illustration, an illustration of childbirth. And, and the point of this illustration is this, that all of creation continues to live in both fear and both pain and hope. It lives in pain and hope. Paul continues, starting in verse 23, with saying this is exactly our condition as well. We, as a specific part of creation, experience the same thing. And not only the creation, he starts in verse 23, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan, same word as for creation, inwardly, as we wait eagerly, for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. He's basically saying that just like creation, we groan. And the reason we groan is we are waiting eagerly for our adoptions as, as children. You say, well, wait a minute. Slade told us last week we were already adopted. Absolutely. All this is saying is that adoption process is still in process. And a day is going to come where it will be complete. It will be finished. And that day is when we are no longer controlled by the corruption of sin. Or is the first fruits of the Spirit? The first fruits of the Spirit refers to the fact that we right now have an appetizer of what this day will be like. And that appetizer is the very presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, comforting us, guiding us, and as we will see, deepening our intimate connection with God the Father. One of the people I talked to this week. Um, uh, someone who was married for years, um, husband has now passed away, and her husband was extraordinarily abusive. And, um, yeah, extraordinarily abusive. And as she told me her story, she said that all that she longed for was to be cherished for who she was. All she longed for was to be seen as a person and not just as a tool for his convenience and his happiness. And that is the sort of inward groaning that Paul is talking about here, that deep interior crying out of, I know that this is not the way it's supposed to be, and I want something different. Verse 24 says that, that the hope for the completion of our adoption, the removal of all this corruption, this hope is the very hope that we enter into when we are saved. And he's just saying in the rest of verse 24 that that hope that is seen isn't hope because you have it. You don't hope for what you already have. I can promise you on Christmas Eve when a kid sees that giant present under the tree, he does not immediately turn around and go to his toy box and saying, wow, I wonder what that present is. Let me look in here. Why? Why? He already has all the stuff in his toy box. What he is hoping for, anticipating, is what he does not yet see. And that's Paul's only point here. And if we do hope, he says in verse 25, 
But if we hope, we hope for what we do not see. And then he says, and this is the key application, we wait for it with patience. Patience is the idea of standing fast. If you look at our society today, ask yourself the question, where does it put its hope? Is its hope in what is seen or is its hope in what is not seen? If you look at our society today, if you watch the news today, radically different opinions depending on who you watch, which news service you watch, who, who you listen to. But you will hear that our hope is in the power of government or you will hear that our hope is in the freedom from government. You will hear that our hope is, is in the getting new people who are in charge. Or you will hear that our hope is retaining the people who are currently in charge. You will hear that our hope is spending money here and you are, others will say, no, we need to not spend money there and we need to spend this money over here. And the problem is that none of them deal with the corruption in the human heart. And so none of them can deliver hope. That's why every generation, every high school graduation that you will go to, will talk about the fact that when they graduate, they will change the world. And you heard the same speech in the 2010s, in the 2000s, in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 70s, in the 60s, and every single one of those speeches is a tie-in directly to what, what we're saying here. Every generation looks at this world and says, this is where my hope is by fixing this world. And Paul is saying in verse 25, that is not where your hope is. Your hope, your assignment is to wait patiently. And waiting patiently, this word has the idea of standing strong, staying the course. Think of walking through a river. I'm not talking about like the Mississippi. Um, a river that's small enough that you can cross, but big enough that it has a strong current. If you've ever done that, you know what it's like to walk across the river and you're trying to get to the other side, but the, but you, the current is, is tempted to knock you over and sweep you away. And Paul is saying in this paragraph, it is worth it to get to the other side, to fight the current, to stay on task, to keep moving forward. It's hard to keep walking. It would be easy to say, I will just try to make it work here in the river. There's a lot of great things in this river. Look at those cool fish. This is a comfortable rock. This is great. I will just stay here. And Paul is saying, you've got to keep going. He is getting us focused on the other side and explaining that there is no way that what you find in this river is as good as what you're going to find on the other side. So why do we wait patiently? Because where we are going is better than where we are. The rest of the passage, verses 26 through 30, break out how we wait patiently. It says in verses 26 and 27, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings. That word again, too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So what this passage is going to break out for us is that there are two hows, two ways that we wait patiently. And one of them has to do with God's presence and the other has to do with God's purpose. And these two verses are about God's presence. And the point is that the Holy Spirit knows us intimately and so he can represent us accurately and powerfully and effectively to God the Father. And God the Father knows the Holy Spirit intimately and so God the Father listens to the Holy Spirit. Verse 26 is saying that the Holy Spirit helps us, supports us, encourages us, empowers us to move across the river. How does he do that? 
by talking to God, when we do not know what to say or how to say it, the Holy Spirit himself takes that to our Heavenly Father, to God the Father. And it's interesting that he picks up the same word here that he's used for creation and for us. You see, here's the idea. The idea is that we have these deep longings, deeper than we even have words for, deeper than than we even know what to say or how to pray. We're not even necessarily aware of the depth of our hurt. We're not necessarily aware of how we are being affected by this fallen world. We are not aware. In fact, Paul has already argued this. We are not aware of the depth of our sin. And he is saying in this verse, the Holy Spirit himself enters into that deep longing and expresses that deep longing, the deep groans to God the Father. He gives voice to what we cannot give voice to. Verse 27 switches the focus from God the Holy Spirit to God the Father. That's who he's talking about here. That is he who searches our heart. And what he's saying is that he knows the Spirit intimately. And because of that, there is the connection, the effectiveness of communication between God and the Holy Spirit. And it's also important to point out that this was God's plan. Right? So often we think, I don't want to bother God with my problems. Or God doesn't care. God's too busy with other things. Right? God's too busy sitting on his couch watching reruns of baseball games played 20 years ago. Just like the rest of us are because we don't have baseball today. I'm sure you all are. And we think that God is so busy with other things that he doesn't care or have time for us. And Paul's point here is this was God's plan. See, the first part of how we wait patiently actually has nothing to do with you at all. It's about the fact that the Holy Spirit is intimately present in you and intimately advocating for you. And our role is to trust that God is present and trust that God understands you even better than you understand yourself. The second how of waiting patiently is God's purpose. Verses 28 through 30 say, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. If you grew up in church, especially verse 28 is familiar to you. But what I want to warn you is it is a verse that is massively understood. And you should be able to see that as we're reading it in its context today. See, the promise of this verse is that for all those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, who is that? Those are his people. Those are believers. What is true about them? That all things they encounter, all the suffering that they encounter, work together for his good. Here's the problem. Here's where things go wrong with that verse. What is the good? So often, what we say the good is, is something else in creation. Right? Someone loses their job and we say, all things work together for the good. You're going to get a better job. Someone is sick. All things work together for the good. You're going to be well. Someone is rejected. All things work together for the good. You're going to find someone better. Do you see the problem? We think that the good is still in the broken and fallen creation. The very creation that in and of itself is groaning. like we're saying if I stopped at this rock on the river all I need to do now is move to another rock it's like we sat down in the middle of the river and then God blasts that rock out from under us to keep us moving and we just immediately assume that what this promise is about is that God is going to give us a better rock to sit on 
verses 29 and 30 actually show us what the good is that God promised. And it is captured in these words right here. To be conformed to the image of his son. And it is simply the idea that God's purpose in our life, the good that he has for us, the good, the greatest good we can ever experience is to be a people who look like Jesus, who love what Jesus loves, who think like Jesus thinks, who relate to people in the way that Jesus relates, who values what Jesus values, and who, whose purposes are the same as Jesus' purposes. The good that we are given when God blows up the rock that we are sitting on is the fact that we, like Jesus, are, becoming to, are coming to the conclusion, which is like Jesus' conclusion, that rocks are never the safe place that provide us provision or, or ultimately make us valuable. Our hope is that God is taking us to the other side of the river and reaching the other side means that we will be just like Jesus. And that will ultimately happen when we get to heaven, but we make progress in it now. Uh, these verses are intimidating because there are some technical terms. Let me just walk through them real quick so you can see how they work together. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now, we immediately run and hide. Um, so let me say this. FBC does not have an official position on how you make sense of God's sovereignty and human freedom and predestination. We do not have an official stance on that. So, um, so I'm not going to stand up here and advocate for one. What I'm going to do instead is for wherever you stand on that debate, there is something that everyone in the debate absolutely agrees on, and I think it's the most important point that Paul is making here, and that is that God has determined that there will be people who make it across the river. There will be people who will become more like Jesus. He knows that. He has determined that. He has ensured it. As you consider all those whom he predestined, he also called. This is such an extremely important word because the idea is that God pursues us. We so tend to make things about our pursuing God. There is not a single thing that we do in relationship with God that is not a response to him first pursuing us. Not one thing. Not the song you sing on Sunday morning, not the prayer you say at night. God is the pursuer. Those he called, he also justified. God makes those people right with him who are going to make it across the river. He declares their sins forgiven. And the ultimate result is that they will see God for who he is. They will see Jesus for who he is without all of the filters of sin. And we will be who we were meant to be, who we long to be in relationship with God, in relationship with one another, and even and how we look at ourselves. So how do we wait patiently? How do we cross the river? We trust God's purposes. It will always look easier to give in to anger, <clears throat> excuse me, or hate or despair or gossip, to be self-centered or selfish. And those are all just ways of finding a rock in the river and stop moving forward. The more we trust that God's purpose to make us like Christ is worth it, the less appealing it is to stop at a rock. Why do we wait patiently? Because where we're going is better than where we are. How do we wait patiently? By trusting that God is present and working out his purposes. I'm going to wrap up, <clears throat> excuse me, quickly, kind of quickly, not that quickly, <clears throat> by identifying two principles. First is, there is a false hope and a true hope. Can I get some water? That would be great. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Not sure where my voice is going, but it's trying to leave me. <clears throat> there is a false hope and there is a true hope that we've seen in this passage. False hope says, change my circumstances, right? right? I want 
this creation that is groaning and fallen, if it will somehow change, then that will make things better. We want the current to stop rushing against us, or we want to find a more comfortable rock. But true hope says that I hope because I'm intimately known by God. I hope because God has taken me someplace that is far better than the best rock I will ever find in this river. And it is what we long for in the deepest part of our souls that we are going to, and it will be worth it. So the question is, where is your hope? Circumstances matter, but they are not what matters most. Is your hope in the creation or is your hope in the creator? <coughs> I'd like to suggest, <coughs> excuse me, that there are three sources of suffering. Our sin, the sins of others, <coughs> in a fallen world. And Satan uses these against us all the time. The question is, how do we live in hope? How do we wait patiently when facing these types of sufferings? And I'll make this chart available. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to suggest that this chart kind of helps us pinpoint where our hope is. We respond to our sin if, if we have false hope by hiding and blaming and making excuses. But the fact that God is present in our lives means that, that he is working and offers us forgiveness. He convicts us and he corrects us. His purpose in our lives in those moments is to root out sin and to replace the corruption that has led us into it. And the sign that we respond to our sin, the suffering that comes from our sin with true hope is that we respond to sin with repentance, belief, and following Jesus. Another source of sin is the sin of others, this woman who is abused by her husband. False hope is, is just to condemn or avoid and destroy. And let me give a caveat here. If you're in an abusive situation, avoid and get out. Get out now. God's presence in your life, though, is doing more than just making you safe. He also wants to heal. He wants to give discernment so you even see in yourself what is right and what is wrong. And he wants you to respond in love. God's purpose is to reveal your sin, to prompt grace and righteousness. And the sign of hope is forgiveness. It's love and it's godly righteousness. I put godly righteousness in there because there are some times with the sins of others we say, this is injustice, this is wrong, and it must stop. That's the message to an abuser. That's the message to people who hurt. Sometimes we're just victims of fallen creation. We live in a world where people get sick and people die. And our tendency, if we have a false hope, will be to flee from it or to try to control it. But God's presence in your life is comforting you, empowering you, and guiding you through it. And what God wants to do is deepen your trust in him. And so a sign of true hope is to say, God, what are you doing in this situation? What are you doing in my life? What are you doing in the lives of people around me? And how do I join you in that work? I'm talking to so many people who feel like God is asking them to cross a river where the current is so strong, it could sweep them away. How do you keep moving? The passage calls us to wait patiently. How do we do that? We need to consider, think about, just like Paul, that we are going someplace that is better than where we are. And that we can trust God is present, and he is at work for his good purposes in our lives. And that's the point. Where God is taking you is worth the journey. The implication of that for this passage is to examine where you put your hope. Let me encourage you just to think about four ways to apply this passage. Rewrite it. We say that every week. Encourage someone with the truth of God's presence and God purpose, God's purpose in your life. The temptation when someone is going through difficulty is to say, I know you lost your job. God's going to give you a better one. He may. 
He may not. But what God will do is to work his efforts to make that person more like Christ. How are you seeing that? How are you helping them to grow like Christ? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal where, your pla- where you place your hope and begin replacing false hope with true hope in one area of your life. I'm going to close in prayer <clears throat> before my voice completely goes. Um, will you stand and join me in prayer? Father, we come to you and we confess. We confess that we are people who look at the creation around us and we say, there is my hope. We strive to cross the river, to live a godly life, to live faithfully to you, and we find that it is difficult and the current is against us. And so very often we just give up and we sit down on a rock and decide to enjoy the surroundings. And Lord, we thank you that you do not give up on us in those moments. You forgive us. Your Holy Spirit does not leave us. Your Holy Spirit is inside of us, empowering us, prompting us to get up and to keep moving, prompting us to see the beauty and wonder of what is in front of us. Lord, we thank you that you love us that much. Lord, we ask that this week we would be a people who live by the vision that where we are going is better than where we are. And that we would be people who embody that vision to a society that right now desperately needs to see that. And that it would characterize what we say, how we say it, what we value, how we think, how we relate. Lord, we need your help with that. and We ask for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So we have said this about God. He knows your deepest longings, your deepest disappointments, your pains. He knows them better than you know them yourself. And he is taking you to a place where they can no longer hurt you. So the charge is to replace the false hopes that you are clinging on to with a true hope of where God is taking you. You are dismissed. I believe our prayer team will be at that desk in the lobby if you need to pray. Thank you for being with us today.